Welcome to Friendly Words, the sermon podcast of Pratt Friends Church in Pratt, Kansas. The message you're about to hear was originally preached at Pratt Friends Church on Sunday, December 13, 2020. Its focus is on the probabilities that Jesus is the promised one, the Messiah which God had said would come. The message to believers is, Jesus is our Savior. Now here's Pastor Mike Neifert. So, about five years ago, uh, Back to the Future 2 uh, references stopped, started popping up everywhere because 2015 was the year that Marty McFly and Doc Brown traveled forward to in Doc's now trash-fueled DeLorean time machine to save Marty's future son, Marty Jr., from a life of crime. In a famous scene which mirrors a moment from the first film, Marty grabs a kid's hoverboard to get away from his arch enemy Biff, and in, 19, in 2015, back in reality, people were jokingly asking, where's my hoverboard? Such toys, of course, we know don't exist, and sadly, neither do flying cars. Where we are going, we still need roads. It's kind of fun to watch those old science fiction shows. They almost always predict future technology, which far exceeds that which, when the actual time comes around, is available. We do have robot vacuums. My wife has one in her classroom, but it's nothing like Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons. Nothing even close to that. It blindly goes around the room bumping into things and making irrational direction changes. I find it kind of amusing. The fanciful depiction of the yet-to-come events which never occur, such as the appearance of dragons in 2020, which the movie Reign of Fire uh, offered to us, can elicit a chuckle or two. Personally, I think gigantic flying reptiles that can shoot fire from their mouths is the last thing we need in 2020. Predictions made in the name of entertainment are mostly laughable. When they get things close to right, we shrug our shoulders, smile a little bit, and move on. And when they do this, when and we do the same when they're way off base. Eh. But what about real predictions? What happens when a word is spoken seriously in the past about something in the future and it comes? to pass? Do we yawn or do we stare in wide-eyed amazement? If we are, in fact, bored by prophecy coming true, we are missing out on an opportunity to shout, woohoo! We're turning away from the chance to worship the God who reveals himself and his truth so that we can know him. Every year about this time, I begin to think about the prophecies that were written about Jesus centuries before his arrival on earth, and I am stunned by the way that God fulfilled his promises so exactly. He wanted us to know, as I put in a sermon just over a month ago, that Jesus, he's the guy. I read an article this week from Empower International on their website, which talked about the probability of one person fulfilling so many words spoken hundreds of years before they even came into existence. Let me read just one paragraph from that article. Anyone can make predictions. Having those prophecies fulfilled is vastly different. In fact, a more, the more statements made about the future and the more the detail, then the less likely the precise fulfillment will be. For example, what's the likelihood of a person predicting today the exact city in which the birth of a future leader will take place well into the 22nd century? This is indeed what the prophet Micah did 700 years before the Messiah. Further, what is the likelihood of predicting the precise manner of death that a new unknown religious leader would experience a thousand years from now? A manner of death presently unknown and to remain unknown for hundreds of years. Yet this is what David did 1,000 years before Christ. Again, what is the likelihood of predicting the specific date of an appearance of some future great leader? Hundreds of years in advance, but that's what Daniel did and did 530 years before Christ. Three events, 
forecast accurately, things which Jesus himself could have no control over as a, as a baby. Can anyone decide which year they're going to be born in? No. Can anyone within their mother's womb make sure that they are born in the right city at the right time? No, and yet that's exactly what God had Daniel and David and Micah foretell hundreds of years before Christ came on the scene. Let me read uh, just a short section of Psalm 22, which is the, the, the psalm that David wrote that foresaw the coming of Christ and foresaw how he would die. The Caesars hadn't even established the Roman Empire. They wouldn't establish the Roman Empire for years and years after these words were written. There was no, David knows nothing of the cruelty of death by crucifixion, but here are the words that God inspired him to write almost a thousand years before Christ came online. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. Especially in that last paragraph. Did you see it? The depiction of crucifixion is uncanny in its accuracy. The details given match what happened to Jesus as he hung upon the cross. His hands and his feet were pierced. The religious leaders mocked him with the words that David had predicted. Dozens stared at Jesus, gloating over the success, their success in bringing about his demise. He thirsted. His mouth was dry. His tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth. The soldiers, who were likely pagans knew and knew nothing of this prophecy, gambled for his, his clothes. Only God could have known the detail, that kind of detail thousands of years before it came to pass. I'll say it again, Jesus, he's the guy. As I read our reading plans passages this week, I recognized three more predictive texts from Zechariah's words of prophecy. There are events in Jesus' life which match predictions recorded in chapters 9, 11, and 12. For the one in chapter 11 and the one in chapter 12, I, find pro I found a probability figure online which suggests how likely it would be for one person to fulfill exactly, precisely, uh, that one prophecy. And that that, and that that one promised person would be able to feel, fulfill that detail by chance. And I'll share those numbers to, with you when we get to it. But we're going to start with chapter 9, verse 9. This is the first of the three, the Savior will do this passages, which uh, Zechariah gives to us. It speaks of an event that took place just days before Jesus' crucifixion. So listen to the words of this prophet. This is Zechariah 9.9. 9. I have part of it up there on the screen for you. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So those words were written almost 500 years before Jesus, and almost 500 years later, Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey. 
In John chapter 12, verses 12 to 16, we have this story. John records the details of the incident, and he says this. This is John 12, 12 to 16. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. So I was listening to a podcast recently. The host stated that scholars, having analyzed John's gospel, note that he only reports on about 21 to 22 days in the life of Jesus. John shared only the details that he thought would be the most compelling, and he wrote these words at the end of John chapter 20. This is verses 30 and 31. John has almost wrapped up his whole story, the whole retelling of Jesus' life, and he says this. John 20, 30, and 31 says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The fact that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, as as the prophet Zechariah proclaimed, met John's that you may know and believe criteria. John included this story so that you would know Jesus, believe on him, and in him find life. Now, if you allow me, I'm going to take just a little side trip here. Let me read the backstory given to us in Mark chapter 11. John simply says that Jesus found a donkey and sat upon it. Mark says it wasn't an ordinary chance finding. In fact, that it happened before any of the people began shouting and praising Hosanna. Jesus sent his disciples to fetch this beast of burden and told them exactly that where it would be found. So listen to Mark chapter 11, and this is the first seven verses. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. And as they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus, and then they brought, when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. And then the rest of that story right in Jerusalem happened after that. So some scholars suggest that Jesus had made prior arrangements with the owners of the donkey to borrow it, and that's how he knew it would be there. But that's not what the text suggests, is it? The text suggests that it's more probable that God's son knew where the donkey was and sent his followers to get it. He knew that the owners he knew the owners' hearts and that they would send it when asked. Let's move on to Zechariah chapter 11 now. We need to read verses 10 to 13. And after we do so, I'll share with you the probability that this prophecy would be fulfilled and, and then share the link to Jesus' life. So Zechariah chapter 11, verses 10 to 13 says this, Then I took my staff called favor and broke it, revoking the covenant I had made with all the nations. It was revoked on that day, and so the oppressed of the flock who were watching me knew it was the word of the Lord. I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they valued me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter at the house of the Lord. The website reasons.org says the chances of one man fulfilling this 5th century BC prediction by sheer luck is 1 in 100 billion. Now, according to the European Space Agency, this is about the same probability of a single person being severely injured by a re-entering piece of space debris in, in any given year. Anybody know anyone hit by space degree? I don't know anybody either. 
The chances that Zechariah's words are fulfilled hundreds and hundreds of years later are infinitesimal, yet they're fulfilled. Perhaps you heard 30 pieces of silver in there, and maybe you made a connection with Jesus' life. In case you've never heard the story, let me read it for you. To see what we need to see, we're going to go to two different passages in two consecutive chapters of Matthew. We're going to start in Matthew 26, reading verses 14 to 16, and then we'll read uh, another section from Matthew 27. So this is Matthew 26, 14 to 16. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Thirty pieces of silver. That's what was weighted out for Judas. That's the same amount that was weighed out for Zechariah that he recorded in chapter 11. And what about the second part of the prophecy, the part about throwing the money to the potter? Well, let's look at this now. We're in Matthew chapter 27, uh, verses 1 to 10. This is the conclusion of Judas's story. He's got the 30 pieces of silver. He's agreed to betray Jesus. He's looked for that opportunity, and here's what happens. Jesus has been arrested, by the way. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who was, had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. Here's another prophecy fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord had commanded me. Judas, the betrayer, brings about the fulfillment of two prophecies. What are the odds? About one in a hundred billion. Know anyone randomly hit by space debris? Nope. Jesus, he's the guy. There's one more Zechariah passage that I want us to look at. And I missed something here. There we go. One more Zechariah passage I want us to look at. It's just one verse, verse 10 of chapter 12. And this is what Zechariah says there, what we, he's written down. He says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. So the chances of any one person fulfilling this prophecy and the one given in Psalm 3420 that not one of Jesus' bones would be broken is one in 10 trillion. In the ebook blog website thingy, I don't know what to call it, what if serious scientific answers to absurd hypothetical questions, scientists address this absurd hypothetical question from a woman named Mimi. If you call a random person and say, God bless you, what are the chances that that person who answers just sneezed? On average, not just in the spring and fall. So that's the question. And their answer starts out, it's hard to find good figures, but it's probably about 1 in 40,000. Then they proposed this scenario to make it a little more complex. Let's suppose that on the day that this article was published, five people, just five, five people who read it decide to actually try the experiment. If they called numbers all day, there's about a 1 in 30,000 chance that at some point during the day, one of them will get a busy signal because the, the person they've called is themselves calling a random stranger to say, God bless you. And there's about a 1 in 10 trillion chance that two of them will simultaneously call each other. Not gonna happen, right? I'm not the greatest mathematician, but I'm pretty sure that that means that this thing is not going to happen by mere coincidence. 
So how does this guy named Zechariah know about crucifixion almost 400 years before it's even a thing? How does David, who wrote Psalm 22 years before Zechariah, receive a similar word and talk about hands and feet being pierced? How does Isaiah, who writes about a suffering servant, know details of Roman crucifixion? Listen to his words from Isaiah 53, should say 53 on that, not 43, verses 4 to 6. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We're going to read that whole chapter this week, so I encourage you just to be amazed and to be blessed by the truth that God knew in advance that Jesus was going to die for us, that he had it planned all along so that he might save us from our sins. So the logical conclusion, the answer that makes the most sense in it sense of all of this is that there is an all-knowing God who prompted all these words to be spoken when they, so that when the promised one came, the people would know it was him. To believe all these men could randomly put words on paper or papyrus or whatever they wrote on and get their predictions right is so astronomically unlikely that it, that it can't even be a, a reasonable or remotely reasonable explanation God's inspiration is the only logical cause of such detailed accuracy. In John chapter 19, verses 28 to 37 then, we see the fulfillment of the words spoken by God through Zechariah and through David and through Isaiah. Listen to what's written. Remember once more, this is written so that you may believe. John 19, 28 to 37 says, Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and as the other, another scripture says, this is Zechariah, they will look on the one they have pierced. All the prophecies... And all the fulfillments matter. The birth of Jesus to a virgin, uh, which we're about to celebrate, has no significance whatsoever if he's not the guy. If he's just a guy who fooled folks and who, who in turn duped us. The odds are against that explanation. The odds point to a God who deliberately sent his son into the world to save sinners like you and me. If you'll give me just a few more minutes... I want to return to the Christmas story. I'd like to read Luke's account of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, the city of God which, which, the city which God told Micah would be the birthplace of the Savior. I'm going to read that prophecy and then read Luke 2, verses 1 to 20. So here's the prophecy. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Now listen as it's fulfilled. Luke 2, verses 1 to 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. 
So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the city of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So what are the odds that Micah gets this right 700 years before Jesus is born? about one in 100,000. But pulling all the prophecies together and seeing prediction after prediction come to pass, no one person could plausibly fulfill all that was said unless he was the one who would come. Jesus, he's the guy. Celebrate his birth with joy. Honor him as Savior and put your faith in him. May God bless you all as you live your life for his glory this week. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for showing us clearly from prophecies that were spoken hundreds of and thousands of years before Christ came that your son, Jesus, is the guy, the guy who came to save. And we thank you for your word for that. And we thank you for the experience of salvation and abundant life that we have in Christ. We thank you for giving us his righteousness so that we might live for you, so that we might be forgiven of our sin. We thank you for raising him from the dead and taking him back to heaven so that we might have the spirit of God to give us life and to give us the power to live for you. I pray, Father, that we might live in the power of the spirit throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless all of you. We hope you have been encouraged and challenged by today's sermon. If you want to hear each week's message, be sure to subscribe to Friendly Words in your podcast app. May God bless you as you follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit.